What do you get when you try to build the biggest air-cooled 3090 you possibly can? Well, you get big chonk. Four slots of 3090 glory. But does it cool well? I don't know. Does it perform well? Maybe. This is the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme 3090. The fastest 3090 that Gigabyte makes. It is four slots. It is chonky. It has three HDMI ports and three display ports and an LCD screen for your stats. Or your GIFs. GIFs? 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 I don't know. How does it perform? How fast is it? Well, that's what we're here to find out today. Whenever we do these overview videos, I like to try and do an unboxing if I can. Fortunately, for the Extreme 3090, I have the box. So let's have a look here. We've got our fancy Aorus graphics. We have the, uh, the GeForce stuff, 24 gigs, three fans, because, yeah, it's in the size of this thing. It better have three fans. Uh, the rear graphics with the wind claw design and the maxed cooling and the screen cooling and the RGB fusions. What, terrible, terrible. We'll get into that. We've got all of our LED edge view. This is one of the cool features, but again, it's problematic. But most importantly, we have Aorus himself. He's in the package. We have the details over here on display ports and HDMIs and then the rest of the general details. So let's open it up. We don't have the 3090 Extreme in here at the moment, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter for what we're looking at here. Opening it up, again, we've got a really nice design, nice easy action. This is where you're going to get all of your documentation. It's nicely sealed in the envelope. Open it up inside. We have information on our four year warranty, where to go for information on it. And then instructions in every language for uh, stuff. Yeah, I'm not even gonna look for the English. Now the phone that they actually have here is really nicely cut out. Like this is this is proper. There's a little bit of a layer here. Like this, this, you're not you could probably throw this thing off of a cliff. I don't have the card in here right now, but you'll get the idea. Again, perfectly cut out. Uh, it's the same sort of foam in here that EVGA uses, but what they do is they put this soft liner over top, which makes it seem way more premium. We have our Aorus. Uh, it, the arms come off for some sort of reason. Oh, I think it's because you can, you can pose them. Yeah, yay! Uh, and we get our sticker that we never put on anyway. And that's all you get in the box. But again, it feels premium. It feels like when you're opening this up that you're opening something special. The card itself though, is that special or does it suck? Now all the board partners have their own approach to things. They have their own way of trying to eke out the most performance possible. They break it into different tiers. So, you know, EVGA's top, top tier is the Kingpin card and then it goes down through the stack. Asus has the Strix line, and then they've got the Tough card, and so on down. MSI has the Supreme X, or Supreme X, however you want to say it. For Gigabyte, it goes the Extreme, Master, and then down through the stack. So the three top cards that you can generally get, depending on where you live in the world, are Galax, which is not typically North America, Asus, which you can get pretty much anywhere, and EVGA, which is a predominantly North American brand. Now the top out of the box performers are the Strix and the Kingpin. The Strix being the more mainstream one and the Kingpin being the more extreme overclock LN2 one. Both of these cards out of the box are the top tier 1920 megahertz. In the next tier down, we've got 1860 megahertz out of the box. Now the extreme falls in this category, sort of. Now, when Gigabyte first released their AIO version of the Extreme and the pre-water block version of the Extreme, they didn't produce 1860 megahertz. They produced 1785. Now, why is it then that the air-cooled one 
is pushed harder than the water cooled ones. We all know that water cooling is what you do to get more performance, whether it's AIO or proper water block. The reason was in their infinite wisdom, they released it with only two eight pins. The air cooled one gets three. You get 150 watts out of each eight pin cable, plus 75 out of the PCIe slot. So you have a double eight pin, like the water forces, then you get 375 watts of official power availability. If you have a triple eight pin, well, that's 525 watts. And that's where the difference is. From a RAM standpoint, they're all the same. You, they all overclock the same, it's all the same RAM, unless you win the silicon lottery, right? Then, then you might get more. All right, so you have your gigabyte card installed, but now you wanna do your overclocking. So that's when you install Aorus Engine. Now, I'm not going to install that malware again on my computer, so we're just gonna look at an image. So what we have here is Aorus Engine. It's Gigabyte's answer to uh, MSI Afterburner or EVGA Precision, and it's fine. You can open it up so you get to watch your overclocks, you get your graphs, you can go over here to do your, your OC scan and your fine tuning of your voltage curve. This is the primary screen where you're going to do your work, memory overclocking, GPU boost, it, it's all the usual stuff. So if you want to use this particular software, it's going to do what you need it to do. Now the problem, isn't the Aorus engine software. It's not very good, it's not very clean, it's not very pretty, but it works. So Aorus engine is fine. It's very basic, but it's going to do most of what it is you want to do. It's not as powerful as MSI Afterburner, and it's not as clean as EVGA Precision, uh, and I can't even remember what Asus calls their software because I don't think anybody uses it either. But you need to use this because this software has this thing right here, the LED. And if you want to access your screen, you're gonna have to use this. Now this is generally what the RGB Fusion 2.0 looks like. Now the graphics card being shown here, unfortunately doesn't have the LCD edge screen, uh, but the, the software, in all honesty, makes it so I don't even want that screen. Now you've got four slots, you may as well put the TV on it, but it works so poorly that it got to a point that every time I wanted to change what was on the screen, I would actually have to DDU out all of my graphics drivers, come back in, have access to it again, set it up, and then the next time I went back into Fusion, it would all be gone. I don't mean the screen, I mean the graphics card it wouldn't recognize that I had the graphics card because it was conflicting with other software on my system. This software alone was the reason why I wanted to get rid of the 3090 Extreme. And it's not a bad card, it's bad software. So what do you get from the screen? Basically, this is it. You can have some stats, it'll rotate through, show anything from your frame rate to your speed, just basic stuff. It's not worth it because you don't sit here gaming going, okay, yes, yes, there it is. There, oh, there's my, my power draw. Now, don't get me wrong, Kingpin card has it too. It's not a bad feature. It's not a selling feature. It's not something that should decide whether or not you get that card, especially with all of the headaches that come along with it. If the software was good and you could get it, awesome but the software is terrible. You're not here for the software, you're here for the benchmarks.
So in looking at it against the Kingpin 3090 Ti, with no overclocks on either card, in Time Spy, you're going to give up 6.5% in your score. In Time Spy Extreme, 6.8%. And in Port Royal, the most graphics-based of these, 6.3%. In Tomb Raider, at the highest settings, with no ray tracing, you're giving up 6.9%. And with the highest settings and ray tracing on, it actually closes the gap, only falling behind by 6.7%. And looking at Hitman 3, we're actually seeing a bigger gap between the two cards. With highest settings, no ray tracing, there's a 10.1% gap. And then when we turn on ray tracing, we close the gap by a little bit more, coming in at 9.3% behind. Now the biggest gap comes from Godfall, where we're 12.5% behind with epic settings and no ray tracing. And when we turn on ray tracing, 10.4% behind. But that's not bad. We're talking about a $2,600 Canadian card versus a nearly $4,000 card. We're talking about a 3090 going toe to toe with a 3090 Ti. You don't really need to go to a Kingpin. You may as well keep it and wait for the 40 series to come out. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what we're doing here, please like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do the things. Uh, leave a comment. Let me know what it is that you'd like to see in future videos. Again, I'm currently waiting on delivery of EVGA's E1 Carbon Fiber Monstrosity. So I'm going to do a build in that. If you have any ideas on how to do the cable management, please let me know because I have no idea until it gets here. I also have to figure out if I can push-pull configure the radiators. The, the manual and the, the pictures are not great. If you're looking for more content like this, uh, there should be some video things here, 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 somewhere around here. So please do give it a click. Take care.